tremendous importance to everyone in the aircraft industry was the meeting of the first international conference on post-war aviation in Chicago, where the representatives of aviation all over the world met to discuss, among other questions, the future freedom of the world's air transportation routes. Before the assembled delegates, representing 51 different nations, a message was read from President Roosevelt, in which the President expressed the hope that the delegates would not dally with the thought of creating great blocks of closed air, thereby tracing in the sky the conditions of future wars. Addressing the delegates, Adolf Burley, Assistant Secretary of State, concluded, I know you will see to it that the air that God gave to everyone will not become the means of domination over anyone. On the unofficial agenda of the conference were doubtless many private discussions on such subjects as the heralded post-war conversion of Boeing's B-29 Super Fortress. The Stratocruiser, it is said, will accommodate 100 passengers and will maintain schedules with speeds up to 340 miles an hour. Officials of the Boeing Company announced the possibility of New York to London crossings at a cost of 60 to 90 dollars with the comfort of a combination observation, dining, and cocktail lounge. And, as they say, breakfast in New York, dinner in London, the same day. Another prominent contender for post-war air travel is Lockheed's giant Constellation, which will carry 55 passengers by day or 38 by night, spanning the continent from coast to coast in an estimated flying time of nine hours. Meanwhile, the Martin Mars, currently flying for the Naval Air Transport Service, is piling up world aviation records. For example, the heaviest load to date, 145,000 pounds gross on takeoff. Providing an answer to the ever-present current problem of supply, and one answer to the post-war questions of air freight, is the new flying boxcar, the C-82, which now carries fully assembled tanks, trucks, or other heavy infantry vehicles for the Army. With its wing spread of 106 feet and a 3,500-mile range, the flying boxcar now makes it possible to move all the guns and motorized equipment of an entire infantry division by air. setters in small planes that suggest a busy future for the aircraft industry is the air coupe, reported so easy to operate that youngsters are flying them after only a few hours of instruction. You can almost hear them now asking Dad, mind if I take the plane tonight? I've got a date in Texas, but I'll be home early. <laughs> small plane making current history is the handy Piper Cub. Here the Piper Cub is shown being prepared for a takeoff from the deck of a standard length LST. Flying from such landing boats, they have proved of great use in spotting enemy beach positions and in observing gunfire. In these wartime operations, it doesn't take an expert to see great new developments in the peacetime application of such planes, creating them that promises to keep the workers of the aircraft industry pretty busy for some time to come. But more immediate is the present job that confronts us all. 500 miles off the coast of Asia lie the Philippines, around 7,000 miles from home. The first steps in our attack there involved softening up Japanese positions and misleading the enemy with a series of strikes which would not disclose the final point of invasion. One of the Navy's great aces, Commander David McCampbell, takes part in the attack. In two actions, McCampbell boosted his score to 34 Jap planes, while dive and torpedo bombers ran up their scores on Japanese shipping.
is easy, and many an American airman has found himself downed in hostile waters. But today, the chances are more than likely that his rescue will come in a relatively few hours. Some time ago, 22 American flyers were picked up by one OS-2U and brought safely to the submarine tank. These pictures, recently released, were made with an amateur camera by a member of the crew aboard the tank. The crippled OS-2U was blown up by the sub's guns, lest it fall into Japanese hands. Territory to the invasion of Leyte, American airmen accounted for some 900 Jap planes shot down in the air or on the ground at some hundred or so airfields dotting the Philippine and surrounding islands. Then the assault forces moved in, landing in one operation on Leyte more American troops than were landed in Normandy on the D-Day of Europe. Thousands of amphibious craft, many of them now like aircraft powered with 100 octane gasoline, surged ashore in the bush. In the invading force with General MacArthur was every able bodied man who left the Philippines with him. And there too was Sergio Osmena, successor to the late Manuel Quezon, president of the Philippines. Aiding the actual landings was the 7th Fleet, commanded by Admiral Thomas Kincaid. To the north was Admiral Halsey's 3rd Fleet. When warning came that the Japanese naval forces were approaching, the 7th Fleet prepared to attack in two directions. Halsey sent down a carrier task force from the north. Halsey engaged the enemy forces in the north. A strong Jap force threatened the Leyte landings from the south. But they were trapped in Surigao Strait by a brilliantly executed Kincaid maneuver. The enemy turned and ran, punished all the while by U.S. bombs and guns. In all, 24 ships were sunk, 34 probably sunk or damaged. Japanese land-based planes did some damage. Not this plane, however. It got a near miss, but it was the last bomb dropped in desperation as American gunnery found its mark and sent the Jap fighter into a deadly spin. But the Princeton was hit and had to be sunk by our own fire. In all, we lost two destroyers, a destroyer escort, two carrier escorts, the light carrier Princeton, and a few lesser ships. Against this loss was piled the substantial loss of a large part of the Jap Navy and control of the eastern approach to the Philippines. But though we are back on Philippine soil and the Japanese Navy has been seriously crippled, the biggest tasks remain. And not the least among them is the production job of feeding a 7,000-mile supply line with a never-ending stream of offensive weapons. The weapons and equipment with which to strike the final blows.